fairly unpleasant times. There's a lot of good to be said about the 14th and 15th century. We love Chaucer and much, I mean, chivalry. If you want to look about the pluses of the period of the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, just think about the series that you see on television. Where would they be? Showtime, HBO, where would all of these series be if they didn't have the 14th and 15th uh, centuries? Think of the Wars of the Roses. Oh, you gods, there's so many. Lancastrians versus Yorkists. And of course, there's more, which leads me to our topic of today, the reign of Edward II. The question we ask, first of all, is one that should you be on Jeopardy? And you remember, you have to ask the question, who was Edward II? And the answer is the worst king in English history. And you say, but wait, wait, I've got another suggestion. Yeah, that's a good runner up, but I think most of us will stick with Edward II. Um, again, we're gonna get his grandson who, it's really close, that, that is to say, Richard II. I mean, he gets a lot of, you know, points, but Edward II is capital L loser from so many levels. It could be because his father and his son were both two of the most famous rulers in English history. You know, when you're like ordinary, that uh, makes it very hard to get a lot of credit. But I still think that most scholars view him as being so weak and so non-kingly that he was basically in the wrong place at the wrong time. And believe you me, he will pay for it big time. So we are told. Um, some aspects to bear in mind as we go forward, it probably would make one think that this was not the best time to want to be a king because even if you were a very outstanding king, you would have faced problems such as the decline of the population based on the fact that climate and crop production simply could not keep up with an ever-growing population, which had been growing for senior, for centuries. We understand that basically uh, a population such as this was dependent on the continuing development of land and the growth of more and more food for people. And when that doesn't happen, in part because of climate, then we understand that population will go down. Now, you may be thinking about the Black Death. Yes, that's coming. But believe me, they had lots of problems before the plague, uh, and including economic problems, the decline of the trade in wool because of the development of cloth industries, 
within uh, England itself, so they no longer had as much trade with continental powers. And the result was that those many people, and Lord knows as you've been there to the United Kingdom, well, no, you're going to see a sheep while you're there. They are everywhere, and that's part of their tradition. The idea being, of course, then that there was a serious economic issue involving wool. Now, I'm not saying everybody suffered. Lots of people made money. They always do, don't they? But we are talking of the masses of people who are probably involved in a small way with the wool business and they are suffering. And as we always find, as we think today in terms of underdeveloped peoples, we have periodic famine. And there are no wealthy folks to help them out. And that is certainly an issue for England and indeed for medieval civilization. And all of this, again, is practicing the Black Death. So that's just, in a cruel way, icing on the cake. I mean, it's like that's part of the woes of the 14th century. But by no means is it the first. Wales and its acquisition by King Edward I was one of, I guess you would say, the great moments for the English. But it was not a matter of happiness for the Welsh. Those of you who saw the series, The Crown, no doubt saw, uh, gosh, I think it was 1969 or sometime way back there when the heir to the throne went to Wales to try to make them happy. And we always understand that that is a very difficult relationship between English and Welsh. Well, if you think that's a concern, we always think of the concern with the Scots and the Irish. They've got some serious issues that they are still going to counseling for. And I don't think that's going to be solved anytime soon. I don't mean to hurt or disappoint any of you, but on and on it goes. Now, those of you who are serious Anglophiles will say, why didn't they just go on and conquer them and be done with it? Well, it's because they probably have too many projects, as we're about to see. And of course, that always brings up the subject of my greatest love, France. The English just can't get free from it. It's in their blood, we, as we know, literally and figuratively, we always think of that Anglo-Norman world, don't we? And we are still, using French as a very major language in so much of civilization. So, you, you know, you just can't say we've got a Scottish project, we've got our Irish project, so we are just going, forgive me, Jenny, au revoir. Uh, we are gonna let it go, but we can't do that. And so through much of this course, <laughs> until the middle of the 15th century, or if you want to think of Calais until the beginning of the 19th century, 
we still try to keep some of it. So it is amazing. So here's Edward. Edward was very genetically the son of his father. In other words, they were tall and they were supposed to have been attractive people, quite the image of the king, physically speaking. But as one famous author spoke of him as being more like someone who would be good as someone in crafts, like arts and crafts, as opposed to being king, talking about damned by faint praise. He would have been good at thatching or all kinds of things like that. You know, when they have those little, uh, I don't know if you call them seminars, to learn how to carry out your home projects. I think if Edward II had been left alone, he could have enjoyed all of that. You know, Home Depot or Lowe's, he would have been the front of the line. Uh, but the fact is, that's why we have people around us. They usually do those things. That's not something that kings do. Uh, but basically, the rule of primogeniture plays a very important rule here. You can't simply say, well, sorry, kid, you didn't pass the final test, so I'm not going to let you be my heir. He was the eldest son, so he's going to be king. Believe me, Edward I, I think, had the terrible burden of knowing that his son really wasn't qualified. But what are you going to do? that was not going to make him in any way worthy of being uh, overthrown. He was married. We will talk a great deal about that marriage. And you will notice she was French and that is not by mistake. It's not that they had gone out a lot, or that it was a casual relationship grown into deep passion. It was arranged, very arranged. And she had a loving father, as he will find out. We know that they had four children and that will be important evidence. There's a rumor that he had another child by someone else, which may be in the uh, apocryphal level, but that's what the uh, some will say. I do this only as background, just to make you aware that when he first became king, that he's already um, in a position to be married. Her father had concerns, not enough to call it off, but uh, we know now he probably should have, but. Uh, he let it go forward. For this first Prince of Wales, and there from a manuscript comes an illustration of that ceremony that we probably recall from the crown. 
in a much later version. What would that, 1970, 71? But mine, uh, Prince of Wales, because Llewellyn would be the last Welch prince. And now Edward I assumes it for his heir. Now, did they ask the Welch about it? Indeed not. So <laughs> you, you Welch like it or lump it. Um, and so it's just interesting. And you notice the date, 1301. So this is more or less the beginning of this interesting tradition of making the Ayer Prince of Wales. And this was done by Edward I. It again rather ensures that at this point, Edward I certainly had no desire to not go on, and he went on for another six years as king. Uh, I think he probably had some misgivings about his heir, but as you see, he went on and gave him the title. Now, as all of this is going on and they set up the plans for the marriage of Isabella with the Prince of Wales, they actually arrange for the father to marry a French princess um, because King Edward I, Queen had died. Well, we can't allow him just to be a widower, can we? Oh, no. More marriages mean more dowries and more negotiations. And so we are definitely interested in moving with that. And so it will be very interesting that uh, Isabella will be dealing basically with her aunt, I suppose, as her uh, sort of foster mother. But they're both French. But then it's not like you would need to take a French court at the course at the English court, right? I mean, French is very much the language. So, I'm sorry. Now, when the the ordination, shall we say, or the coronation of the ruler takes place, it still. Uh, goes something like you have here. Uh, been a long time since they've had one, right? I mean, long time. So only someone who's fortunate enough to remember the Eisenhower administration, early Eisenhower to boot, would have gotten to see this although it may be on YouTube, I don't know. But um, the fact is, and I won't go through the whole thing, it is the questions that were asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury to uh, Queen Elizabeth were very much what you see here. But way down at the end, you will see what was added for the 
coronation of Edward II. And what's important is to understand that those folks knew what they were doing because he got ratemyprinceofwales.com the lowest rating. I mean, it was terrible. So what are they asking him? They write sassy if you want to ask me. Sire, do you grant to be held and observed the just laws and customs that the community of your realm shall determine? And will you, so far as in you lies, defend and strengthen them, strengthen them to the honor of God? I grant and promise them, no doubt with those fingers crossed. Now, no king before Edward II had made that commitment. And obviously he committed something that I wouldn't want any of us to commit. And you know what it is, starts with a P and has three syllables. Perjurer. And you're saying, oh no, the new king was a perjurer. I pretty much can promise you he was. That man knew he wasn't going to do that because essentially that in, in, in says that the community of your realm represented by the uppers, the nobles and the well-to-do, you know, the who's who of England, they are going to quote unquote help you by pointing out the do's and don'ts. And those are the just laws and customs. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to say, thank you. I mean, merci beaucoup. Yes, Jennifer. So, more or less, we understand that this is a lie. And people who tell lies, as undoubtedly your parents pointed out to you, come to no good. It's bad to lie, especially under oath. Luckily for us, our great queen since the 1950s has been telling the truth. But not this twerp back in 1308 as it was. By the way, shortly after he became king, the wedding took place of Isabella and the new king. I think he had more or less, I don't know why Philip the Fourth, who was the father of the new queen, would agree to it, but he did. Even though the issue you see illustrated by some 19th century illustrator obviously this is not great art but it will give you an idea of how the relationship will be depicted here you will see um, in the background various individuals including it appears the queen looks like the royal children and the nobles. And what you see is the new king with in fact his special friend that will be greatly, uh, shall we say, debated. 
His name was Piers Gaveston. Gaveston indicating a Gascon background. And he came from a family of some prominence. That is to say, if you're from Gascony. Well, you know how that goes. Those of you who are from large cities will understand that those of us who are from small towns, we can talk about people who are highfalutin from our communities, but basically they are not big deals in the larger places. And that's the, the problem with Piers Gaveston because he was not by any means suitable to be in the mainstream of English society, except he was the king's friend, quote unquote. Edward I, already had tried to deal with him. And the minute Edward I, you know how they always say, before he was cold, Peter Gaveston was back. Just take the next uh, boat across the channel. And of course, this is not a proof because Piers was not part of our crowd. And they really realized very soon that he had more influence on this young king than they liked. They gave him the title Earl of Cornwall, which was a title of the royal family. I mean, that is just, what do you say? It's just not done. And yeah, he's king, but he's not really in a position of security as king. So this kind of hard-headedness about Piers Gaveston, I would even go so far to say flaunting the uh, major people around him will do the king little or no good. Resentment, and I think it's not too strong a word, uh, you could call it jealousy, you could call it resentment, you could call it a thought that the king has not done for us what he should have, or the king shouldn't be the king, is personified by a person that in many ways represents uh, the figure of the great noble, I'm part of the royal family too, but I just didn't happen to be the firstborn male, so I have to be satisfied with having territories that are most of northern and middle England and ride around and be powerful. And yet, I'm not king. His name is Thomas of Lancaster. And so he is basically, and some of you that study genealogy will know what I mean, first cousin once removed because they were both grandsons of Henry III. So Edward I would have been his uncle. But this is always like when you get together with folks at Thanksgiving and they tell you and 
you go over there and say, oh, this was so wonderful. We got to be with each other as family. Well, I'm thinking that's pretty much like Thomas of Lancaster and the king. Um, king Edward II was probably a bit jealous. Thomas had so much land, so much power. He held so many fiefs. And most of us know that area of Lancaster, but that is just the beginning. So much territory and power. He even had his own army. It's like you need your own folks to run things for you. So these people are not, it's not like he's just uh, waiting for the king to help him. Oh, no. He's got plenty going for himself. The problem is, though, he resents the king. He resents the king simply because the king doesn't take him into his confidence. He expects, well, that was his cousin. He expects for him to be diplomatic and tactful, you know, get one of these manuals, how to be a successful king, you know, how to be. And, and obviously, if, you know, this Cornwall fellow, this Piers Gaveston is getting in your face and saying, well, I'm sorry, but the king is indisposed. You know, when they say that to you, the stuck up way. I'm sorry, would you like to make an appointment? Maybe we can work you in next week. Have you ever had a reception and said that to you? Maybe there'll be a vacancy. Yeah, I mean, do you know who I am? I had a student say that to me once. Yeah. Uh, I am Thomas of Lancaster. I am a big, big fella. Well, I'm the Earl of Cornwall. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a power play and it's not going to be good. Now, this is not National Arbor Day, but I love trees. And this is my idea of a good tree. And believe me, it will not be on your phone but I just think you need to be aware of how, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I won't use the pointer. Uh, you can see, if you look all the way up at Henry the third, you'll be able to see Edward. And if you follow all of his various offspring, you will see Edmund, crouch back and you say oh I think he was married to someone French surprise Blanche of Artois they have more French Anglo-French DNA mixtures going in that royal family you say well can't they find just a nice English girl to marry mm, I don't think that's going to be advantageous but going on down in those Lancastrians, you can understand, and you get there, there's Thomas, and Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, so that's our fella, and he is basically on the line with Edward II. All of this, then, is to say that Thomas, in addition to being a warrior and somebody who had lots and lots of interests, is probably singing. Some of you remember that song, It Should Have Been Me. It's always like, why do I have to be number two or number three? And it's probably a case of influence and all the rest. We see this in French history, it goes on and on and on, if you are not the prime heir and you never, I guess you'd say, come to terms. That would be true even in Edward II's family. 
because you can see, uh, and this is very briefly, that Edward I will have subsequent children by his second wife. And you see that Thomas up there, I know they can't see my finger, but <laughs> Thomas and Edmund up there under Edward with Margaret of France. You can see there. And they will have very prominent roles as uh, younger sons, stepbrothers, as it were, to Edward II. And you think, well, they can be supportive sometimes if it suits them. But they too had their own interests. And again, it's not that anybody is being deprived or being sent home without supper. They're all doing very well, thank you very much. But again, it's always a power play and you go, but who likes this usurper? Gavison. Well, the king does, apparently a lot. Anybody else? Uh, I guess not. So that's the situation that you are going to be in. The situation with Gavison gets so bad that in fact, the advisors will more or less, or that is to say the would-be advisors will put into or attempt to put into practice something called the ordinances, which give a royal cabinet authority to approve the king's appointees. You can imagine how poorly that went over. Because this is the very thing they had done to the king's grandfather, Henry III. The idea of saying, well, really, before we do that, we need to talk about it and approve it. Again, I don't think Queen Elizabeth or King George, her father, would have had a problem with it, but they, they had centuries to prepare, right? I mean, but in these earlier periods, these folks just wanted to do what they wanted to do. So the ordinances were offending the king. And one of their policies, and that was probably cousin Thomas of Lancaster, who would ship Piers Gaveston home, or at least he got him to Ireland, but he didn't stay. About that time, 1311, I think he was away maybe six months. He and the king were apart a very short time before the king basically, but they've sent him by messenger saying, I command that you re return to me or whatever he did. And that was all that. Thomas of Lancaster, as illustrated there, will determine that Gavison had to go. And you say, do you think the king was cross or irritated? Yes, I think he was very irritated. I think the queen was pretty happy. I mean, again, Gaveston really didn't have any allies. I don't think he was exactly a diplomatic sort of person. So this uh, decision of Thomas of Lancaster and the others to put Gaveston out of commission was more or less to make the ordinances work because now, you know, they can handle the king because the king's not going to have Gaveston anymore. So it's going to make it, um, shall we say, 
more likely that now King Edward II can be controlled. I have to tell you this story. I was in Scotland once on a touring bus. And you know, like you do sometimes if you're having a nice bus ride and you're just going along and you might just nod off. Not really sleep, it's just a little unwilling nap. You don't mean to. I've had students do this to me. Shocking, <laughs> shocking. But I know you wouldn't do it. I trust you. But anyway, the bus lurched. And lest I sue the driver over possible neck injuries, I realized we were in Scotland. And the Scottish bus driver was so excited, he lost his smooth, easy driving stuff. And he pulled it over and he said, I, I, and he just was beyond himself. And I thought, well, bring out a bottle of Glenlivet. What is it that we are all excited about? And what we were excited about was the site, and many of you been there near Sterling Castle. Oh yes, get your t-shirts and get your souvenirs and your mugs. They've got it all for those with Scottish blood. The bottle of the battle of Bannockburn. Oh, the Scots love to talk about that. Anglophiles be warned. If you go there, I would go there incognito. And you just say, I, laddie, I, you know, uh, because this is a Scottish love center. That particular site, because let's face it, the Scots had a lot of heartbreak as far as fighting with the English. So when under Robert Bruce, who became Scottish King, when they defeated the English under Edward II, there's reason to celebrate. And there's reason for mugs and t-shirts and other kinds of industry. Do you think we stopped? Do you think my driver was lurching over at the numerous English victories in southern Scotland? Well, the answer is no. We stopped at this place. That cracked me up. I thought that was hilarious because uh, they still find this um, to be a site of great enthusiasm. And of course, that's supposed to be Bruce, who will now assume the title of king. I would like to tell you, Scottophiles, that the rest is smooth sailing, but I would be a liar, and uh, I'm not going to. Let us just say that was a great moment of triumph. And Thomas of Lancaster back in his estates, I don't even think he uh, participated in this. And he can imagine uh, he had a certain sense of joy to see the English defeated and to see his hated rival, the king, that is say Edward II, so humiliated. Edward II, ultimately then a failure in the Scottish campaign, which had been very important for King Edward I, 
uh, was unable to resist the noble forces when they wanted to impose the ordinances and assume these various controls. So Thomas of Lancaster and his stalwart more or less dealt with the king who was somewhat passive aggressive. But for those years, maybe 13, 14, 13, 15 to 1321, they would control what Edward did. I think you could say it was not a pleasant situation for either side, but I think you understand why. After what had happened in Scotland, after the king was giving so much power and prestige to favorites and leaving out people who call themselves the natural advisor, because we are the great ones, we should be in authority. So Edward, I guess, at that stage after Gavison's death, he really did not have the smarts to do it himself. And he had no one who could explain to him what he should do. So he develops, I guess, what we would call passive aggressive attitudes towards the great nobles. By 1318, Thomas, more concerned with his own lands up north and not being a particularly effective individual. If we compare him to say Simon de Montfort, he would get, oh, C plus maybe, if even they, uh, I would just say mediocre. That's not a nice word though. Uh, he did not dynamic and just self-serving. So he gives it up and this middle party, people who weren't either pro-King or pro-Thomas are able to take over the government. What is Edward II doing, the, doing during this period? I think he's basically just waiting. Uh, because I don't think as long as he was alone, he could come up with anything to run it. And then comes this man, Hugh Dispenser, called the Younger because there was an elder. And we are interested in that elder because the elder had been advisor to Edward I. So my idea is that Hugh Dispenser the Younger is probably a huckster out to gain power. The king wants a friend and Hugh Dispenser with the help of his father. Oh, you know how you meet people and you say, do you come here often or whatever it is. It's uh, Hugh Dispenser and, and you can see there if you, can notice those letters beneath Hugh's name, you see Count of Gloucester. And so he had a nice title and he will enjoy the favor of the king. Now he's not of that level of Thomas, but he's gonna become the king's new best pal. And do you think, I'm just, 
I have always believed that his father set him up and got him fixed because these people know how when they need to know how to gain influence. What is it they say? Win friends and influence people. And I think Hugh Dispenser learned how to do that. And he will enjoy it because he will become the one. And you think, why must Edward II fall so hard? I don't know, but that's the way. And when it happens, then Edward's going to be saying things like, well, I'm just not going to put up with this anymore. You all have irritated me. I'm cross. And Hugh and I, I mean, I think, you know, you know what's coming. Hugh's going to be, I'm going to decide what the government does. In other words, the king is going to be able to break free because Hugh says so. And it seems an odd situation, but that is the way it appears to have been. In fact, Spencer will denounce Thomas. It's amazing how Spencer could get this kind of power and lead an army, a royal army against the king's own cousin. I mean, Believe me, Thomas had a big army, so it's not like, you know, he just pulled little Tommy out there by himself. No, he had a big army, and you can still see the site, you know, on your tours. Another mug. Uh, there'll be the, the, more, the Borough Bridge Museum and you military types. There will be plenty of that, maps. Those the English, they know how that we Americans, we cannot get too much Anglo-Scottish material and we will pay. So they defeat Thomas. Thomas is uh, executed by order of the king. He is abused. I would, can imagine the people out there with the snowballs who, who would do that to Thomas of Lancaster. You know, the big bullies, you know, they were probably regular people. And you know, these uh, supporters of Dispenser probably say it, it's okay. Do you wanna go beat up on a nobleman or something like that? I, I don't know, it's just hard for me to imagine but he was abused before his execution. And you think, executing someone like Thomas of Lancaster? Well, he was declared a traitor. And you think, how do you do that? You get a lot of very important people around you, if you're the royal government, and say, don't you think Thomas of Lancaster is a traitor? And they'll go, we, we, and... He's a traitor. And you know what we do with traitors? Yep, they're gone. They're goners. So, without Thomas of Lancaster around anymore, presumably other individuals who had been rebels, who had been enemies of the king, are going, as we like to say, to lay low, <laughs> to wait for a better time of coming. And meanwhile, Dispenser, who seems to have enjoyed rather total control over the royal government, you know, I've seen some of those documents that uh, would indicate that he is 
the individual in charge that he is so high in the king's council that he can now speak on behalf of the king. And so you have a mass of individuals who are running the government for their own enrichment and power. And so it's a, a feeding frenzy. Shocking to those of you who are used to good government of uh, corruption and nepotism. Uh, I know these are horrible things to think of, but it happens at some time. Meanwhile, there is an Anglo-Scottish -Scot peace, so we don't have that to annoy us. So the money that would have gone, I suppose, for the Scottish campaign, we can spend it on ourselves. The idea is that the years of the Spencer's rule on behalf of Edward II will be years of great corruption. But there will be bad news rather quickly for Edward II. You'll notice that I have not mentioned the French in a, several minutes. I mean, they're still there. They're watching what's happened to Sis, that is to say, Isabella, the English queen. Because Philip IV died in 1314. He will leave three sons who will succeed him. The irony of that is that neither, or I shouldn't say neither, excuse me, Carol, none of the three sons had a son who lived. Therefore, that's right, Jenny, you go from Charles and uh, to Philip to Louis, or rather Louis to Charles Philip. It's basically these three and a, sit a very, very strange situation. In any event, The Anglo-French difference was very minor, but it gave the French, the only excuse they needed was to reoccupy that beautiful little part of South France around Bordeaux. If you know that area way down south, just before you get to the Pyrenees, and, you know, all of this, if the English had just said, shoot, y'all just go on and take it. We have some big plans. We're so busy in Wales and redeveloping Wales. But you know, that's just not the way that folks do things. So they will play this cat and mouse game of King Charles IV who is going to reoccupy that little bit of territory still held by the English on the grounds that the English had not fulfilled their feudal obligations, you know? And they can find somebody who can say, oh, the English have been so naughty please, King Charles, would you do something for us? Of course, we love all the people, you know, and all of that. So that's not a problem, but it's going to cause a big problem for Edward, who is both brother-in-law and get this, 
King Charles Vassal. It's a technicality, yes, but it comes up at Thanksgiving, I bet. You know, when they're sitting across the table. Because you know how people will throw things like that to, in your face. You have a little too much of that good French wine. And it can cause people to be rude. So, now what I fondly call the revolt of the queen. Yes, she has put up with a lot. And she has had a lot of time to think about how irritated she really is. <laughs> I mean, you know, she had been over there as the uh, future queen for some years. This was the daughter of King Philip IV. She had become the uh, queen to be because of this Anglo-French agreement to try to settle the difference. In other words, Philip IV agreed to this marriage of his daughter so that these matters would be settled. Obviously, people in this social rank did not have a lot of say-so about uh, the marriage partner. So she had had to put up with Edward II, four children. And instead of getting better, well, let's just forget about the unpleasantness of Piers Gaveston. Let's, let's try to work things out. I think under dispenser, it just got worse. And it seems to me that Isabella was someone who probably would have wanted some authority. I mean, there were some queens who actually enjoyed some authority, had some. Uh, but you see here someone who is not enjoying any. And in fact, the relationship has reached the point of outright hostility. So somehow she persuaded, despite Hugh Dispenser's concerns, she persuaded her husband to allow her to act as his proxy in Paris. Because of course it was her brother. That is to say, King Charles IV. She will be going, if you stop and think about it, basically as the Duke of Aquitaine's representative, not as the King of England's representative. It seems a little weird to us, but that's the way it was. Technically, you are going in that way. Now, why doesn't King Edward go himself. Well, I don't think Hugh Dispenser wanted him to. I really don't. I think it was a matter of, I got him where I want him. And if he gets to Paris, he may get ideas of independence. For whatever reason, they agreed to send Isabella, which is a godsend for her, as you can imagine. It's basically like getting away. Because it is almost like you are something of a captive. Now she gets there, it's so 1325. So she gets to her brother's court there in Paris. And from what I've read of the documents, I mean, she is accepted as. Uh, I think you would understand the uh, king's sister, that is to say, King Charles' sister. And uh, I'm sure she had gazillion lawyers and envoys and all those people who could do all the business. You know, they had a lot of 
festivals and galas and receptions, you know, they're not going to go to all those conferences. I think they have some other things, other activities. But that's her power. However, and there is actually documentation for this. She's over there in Paris and she will send by messenger a communication to her husband saying, oh, I miss you. I miss you so much. Share, get it, dear. And I'm so anxious that I get this business set, uh, straightened out in Paris and I can be home with you. Uh, could you send the boy over? And that is the elder, the eldest boy who will be Prince of Wales. Oh, he's about at this point. 11, I'd say. Send him over so he can do these things that my brother needs done. You say, why couldn't she do them? Well, I think, frankly, because she was a woman. That's all that I can figure out, that they would allow the son, even though he was so young, to do fealty and homage in his father's place. Because, of course, Hugh Dispenser is not going to let the king go. He's going to come up with things. I've got a sick headache. I've, I've got a tooth that needs pulling. Uh, you know, there are always a million excuses for not doing things. So they're not going to let Edward second L. But amazingly, they let this boy go. This 11 year old. So he joins his mother and boy, she is happy. Uh, because you've got, well, we see it in the paper all the time, how people fight over children. So, no surprise here that the same thing is true once Isabella's got him. She's going like, yep. How could they let him go? But he's here now in Paris with me. And it will change everything. Because now she plans to take over the English royal government. How much of this was because of the queen herself or because she had made a new special friend? This new special friend is what we call a Welsh border lord. He wasn't Welsh. Oh, Lord, no, don't even go around saying that but he had lots of land as a result of the fact that the English conquered these uh, territories. And the, he lost a lot of the lands in that encounter at Burbridge. His name was Roger Mortimer. And uh, he had been imprisoned. Or if they just had capital punishment, there wouldn't be a story here, but instead he was imprisoned and he must have gotten out. This Roger Mortimer. And he went to France. And he just happens to be at the court when Queen Isabella's there. Oh, you just say, oh, so you're Roger Mortimer. I've heard, yes, your majesty. It's so nice to see you. Do you come here often? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, it all seems so nice. Oh, you're, you, you, uh, it's wonderful. I know to be at your brother's court. Yeah, you want to get together and do some horse riding or maybe you could play some chess. I don't know. 
you know, these activities, and it all seems so right, and yet it's so wrong, because we can see where this is going. It's going to the violation of sacred marital vows. Yes, both Mortimer and Isabella become adulterers. And so much so that the king, basically that is her brother, asks them to remove themselves from the royal court. I think, you know, you're pushing the boundaries here. We know about chivalry and all of that, but I think probably it's nice and courtly love to have the nice stories and all, but I think this was just a bit much. So, Isabella and Roger Mortimer do more than pillow talk, and that will be the beginning sort of this coalition to take over the English government. Uh, as such, it will be amazing to think that Edward II or really Dispenser was so unpopular that they were able to use resources they had, that is the queen and a Mortimer to take over the English government. It, uh, you know, I don't I never, thought that Edward had a lot, Edward II had a lot going for him, but he didn't even have his own son. That is to say, the future King Edward III. So with the queen having little Edward, I guess, and Roger Mortimer as her lover, shout, uh, parenthesis, confederate, it appears that they were ready. And that would happen in 1326. Now you say, coup d'etats can be expensive. Yes, they can. I'm glad you brought that up. Where are we going to get the money? In a beautiful part of Northern France. Uh, not at that time, but in today's world, an alt, or Hainault, I think it is, Jenny, up there near Flanders, uh, Belgium. And in that, there had been negotiations thinking about a marriage of young Edward. So Isabella and Mortimer go up there from Paris and negotiate a wedding settlement. And this is uh, the dowry as in, what's it worth to you? And it's worth a lot. And this dowry, which will produce one of England's great queens, Philippa, not yet, of course, because her future mother-in-law's got a few things to do. But we'll take that dowry right now, and we're not talking China and silver. We want some army, we supplies, we want military, and they will get it. And the result of all of this will be the invasion that will lead to the overthrow and death of King Edward II. And not too many tears will be shed, I can assure you. As from 1327 to 1330, the Queen and Mortimer will control the government. And one day, Edward III 
who's a teenager, and we all know teenagers, gets up, he says, I am just tired of mom and Uncle Roger telling me what to do. I want to tell them what to do. And he will. In 1330, he will have Uncle Roger executed and his mother put into a convent. I guess that she can uh, pray instead of being a bad girl. And there she will remain. She's got decades to pray about her sins. So much for carnality. So it is now 354. So I think I'm about on time to allow, if I've said some Jenny or anybody, bad French words or